So let's get started. Why don't you just go ahead and tell me what is the challenge that you're facing and uh, how can I help you? Oh, okay. I am stuck. Okay. Like I feel like I am in quicksand and every time I try to move, I sink. Um, and I've been on the personal growth the development for years. I've read like all these self-help books. I've done programs. I've done, but I still feel like my, like I'm 44 now. And I feel like life has passed me by. I feel like I'm in a job that's, I mean, pays bills. <laughs> it's not fulfilling. Um, I thought that I'd be in a, you know, relationship of have a husband and have kids by now, but don't. I, I, the, the relationship with myself is not where I'd like it to be. And I, I also like, uh, I, I'm in the worst shape that I've ever been in my life. And I look at myself in the mirror and I'm just like, okay, those 30 pounds, where did they come from? Oh yeah, that's right. You made all these choices of eating bad food, right? And so I just feel like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I don't know. Well, I do know where to start, but at the same time, I don't. I feel like I don't know where to start. So I just feel like, yeah, I, I, I don't know where to go from here because I've read all the books, because I've done all of that stuff. I'm just like, but I'm still here. Mm. Okay. Thank you for sharing all of that. And mm -hmm. what I got is that you're in a job that's not fulfilling, but it pays the bills. That you're in the worst mm -hmm. shape of your life and you have put on an extra 30 pounds that you are not where you thought you would be in your personal life because at the age of 44, mm -hmm. you thought you'd be married and have four kids. And your relationship with yourself is also in the gutter. And on top of all of this, you have been somebody that has read all these self-help books. You are interested in personal development and yet you still mm -hmm. feel very stuck. Did I get it? Is there anything else? You've got it in a nutshell, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do you want to hear the good news or the bad news? Let's go for the bad news. Okay. <laughs> so the bad news is that um, you are going to have to push through the emotion and the resignation that has built up. That's the bad news. That your own story that you mm -hmm. are not where you should be, that you made all these bad choices, that mm -hmm. none of the stuff that you do is actually gonna result in the big changes that you want. The bad news is your own attitude and story and emotions are going to be the biggest obstacle in your way. Do you want to know the good news? Yes, let's get some good news on there. Well, what it what happened? I saw your your face kind of go like oh, yeah. when I said the bad news. So what what was your reaction to the bad news? <laughs> cute like it's like I gotta do this it just it felt it feels overwhelming it feels like this is some work some real work that I have to do and it feels like daunting why does it feel daunting so I feel like I have so much work to do I feel like there's just this insurmountable mountain that is just unattainable. But then there's another part of me that's like, no, it's not. Like, you can do this. You, you've got this. 
But there's that part of me that's just like, hmm, Ricky, it's not going to happen for you. And are you experiencing the life that you want to be living right now? No. There's moments. There's moments, yeah. But the overall, no. Okay. No. See, the thing is that the reason why the mountain feels insurmountable is because you've convinced yourself that it's too late. That's the only reason why it feels insurmountable. The work is the work. And the work that will change your life and get you in shape and help you find a fulfilling career and get your life force back and have you have a wonderful relationship with yourself. And when that happens, the right person walks in. The work you need to do is the same work everybody needs to do to have those things. It's the story that you're telling yourself that you're already fucked up and that it's too late and that it's going to require too much and it, it's not going to happen. That's the only reason why you haven't gotten started. If I could tell you that the best years of your life were ahead of you, would you do the work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. The best years of your life, Ricky, are ahead of you. You know what? There's a voice in my head right mm -hmm. now. And that voice says, this is, this is BS. And the best years of your life were before, like when you were 22, when you were, when you're, when you were in your twenties, that's where there's like this, there's this recording back there that's saying that. And it's so frustrating. It's extremely frustrating because I want to believe it. I want to believe you when you tell me that my best years are ahead of me. And I have friends who tell me that the best years are ahead of me. It's like, why can't I believe that? Why can't I take what you're saying and, and actually truly hang on and believe it 100%? Because that's really what I want. There's a number of reasons. Because I got to believe it to achieve it, right? Yeah. There's a number of reasons why. Number one, you've been telling yourself the other story for so long that it's not going to happen. That that's become your belief. Number two, because that's been your story, that it's not going to happen, and you're sad about that, your actions in your day-to-day -day life, your routines, your rituals, your habits, they now match that story. Mm -hmm. And so you have started to align with a person who believes that the best days of her life are behind you which is why you're not taking care of your health. It's why having a job that is slowly sucking your soul dry, but paying the bills is enough. It's why you've kind of given up uh, or lowered your standards when it comes to uh, the kind of person that you want to attract. Your actions keep you stuck because your actions are the kind of actions that somebody who doesn't believe that the best days of their life are ahead of them ahead of them are taking. And so the solution is to figure out what the day-to-day -day life looks like of a woman who believes that the best days of her life are ahead of her. And by God, she's going to act that way. Mm. And I also have a suspicion. I have a suspicion that something happened to you, either in your late 20s or in your 30s, that knocked you on your ass and knocked you off track and you haven't recovered from it because it strikes me that you say my 20s were the best time of my life and so tell me about what was going on in your 20s that made you feel like it was the best time of your life and then I want to know what the hell happened that changed it I feel like in my 20s I was more confident um, I was doing the things that I liked. I was, I was, um, 
What really happened? My dad died. Okay. How old were you? He died when I was 28. Um, yeah. And there was, after that, there was some depression that happened and, you know, um, some significant breakups mm -hmm. that happened. Um, and I feel like those were just like probably things that kind of crushed me. Exactly. And I just didn't really recover. There you go. That's what happened. You experienced profound loss. And the loss of your father, followed by the breakup of a significant relationship, spun you around. And you have an opportunity to figure out what does it look like for you and your life now to create that foundation that got ripped out from underneath you when you were in your late 20s? If I had to, to describe it, I would say that you went through a great loss and you have spent a decade grieving. And whether you realized it or not, and that in the past couple years, you've spent these past couple years kind of waking up from that and being disappointed with where you are. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. It's okay. And one of the reasons why it's so easy, Ricky, to find yourself in a situation where you've read all the books, you listen to the podcast, but you do nothing is because I think you're stuck also in a kind of freeze trauma response in your body where things kind of stopped moving forward when your dad died. And you went into kind of this mode, I kind of have this vision of you, almost like hunkered down waiting for the next thing to happen. So like you go mm -hmm. into this mode of not mm -hmm. dreaming, not going for it like you used to in your 20s, but narrowing your focus to just getting through the day. And when you read all the books, you gain knowledge, right? That stays right up mm -hmm. here. But mm -hmm. what you're dealing with is you're dealing with um, something that happened to you in your heart and your soul. Is any of this landing for you? Yeah. Yeah, and it's the strangest thing is that I've never really put that together. Like, I never really connected that. Um, like, I, I didn't really feel like I've been grieving over for 10 years. I, I felt like... Like when people ask me, like, like when I think about my dad passing away, I feel like I've grieved and I feel like I've moved forward and I feel like I'm okay with it. I, I, I didn't really connect my being stuck in my life to do that. So I think in some ways you gave up on your own mm -hmm. dreams. And then the breakup happened. And maybe was it some was were you with somebody that you thought you were gonna marry? I did. Um and it's weird because it's not just one relationship. It was like everything, every relationship that I kind of got into afterwards, it was just like 
don't know. I, I, I can't even really explain it. Um, but in my mind, I believed that more would come of it. Mm. And I'm embarrassed even like talking about this right now. Why? Um, why? Um, because you, you don't want to be that person that thought there was more and then there really wasn't. And I, I feel like that's what I have been. And yeah, that's why. It's, it's, and it's, it, it hurts. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I can see why that would hurt. And I want you to consider looking at those relationships through a different lens because we're going to start working on the story that you're telling yourself. Because part of the relationship story is I'm a failure, I fall for people, and I think that it's going somewhere and they don't want me the way that I want them. I'm a failure. And I have a hunch and again, we just met, but I have a hunch mm -hmm. that if you were to look back on those string of relationships that didn't work after your father died, you were coping with your grief. You were not showing up healed, whole, confident you. You were showing up in those relationships with a hole that grief had created and so when you get into a relationship and you get attached to somebody because they are filling a need that you have that you can't do in your own life mm -hmm. that's when things get out of balance and because you were grieving and I get the sense from you because you strike me a little bit like me that you thought you were fine so we're going to move on and we're going to keep working and we're going to go forward with life. And now I'm going to meet this person and everything's okay because I don't want to scratch on that deeper thing that's really painful because I'm okay and I'm not, and I'm going to be tough. And yet you carry all that stuff with you. And I think that's what happened in your relationships. That you were so wanting to be, um, basically to disappear in a relationship and to feel safe again that you fall very quickly and then you misread the room and that's it that's all that happened again because of the grief and this is all very normal and when you start to see that things aren't lining up the way that you expected you start to feel bad about yourself and you start to wonder mm -hmm. what's wrong with me and there's nothing wrong with you nothing and what you get to do now Ricky is we get to say today is day one of you reclaiming your happiness and taking your life back and healing what needs to be healed and defining for you what does a really fun and exciting life look like and so I want to walk you through a super simple exercise okay okay I can see you processing what emotions are coming up for you <sighs> I I don't want to cry <laughs> why because I feel like If I cry right now, it'll be really ugly. <laughs> Great. And it'll just be really sobby and- Great. Um, what are the tears about? Letting go. Mm -hmm. I 
I am so used to, this might sound really crazy, but so used to feeling a certain way that feeling, that imagining feeling differently feels almost uncomfortable. What is the way that you're used to feeling? Let it come up. That is not, doesn't matter how much I, that, that how much good comes into my life. Event like it will never be how I want it to be. Like I will never get to where I, all the things that I desire, they'll, they'll actually never, like, it'll, it'll come so close, but not for me. It happens to everyone else around me, but it won't happen for me. Mm -hmm. Well, it definitely won't, if that's your belief. Because you won't let it in. Yeah. And is this the way you want to experience life? No. 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 And what would you have to change about the way that you live your life or the story that you tell yourself in order to have a different experience? I would have to change that story. I would have to change that belief. I would have to yeah. do things differently. Maybe. Yes. You'd have to cry. And the tears are super important because in the, on the topic of your dad, all the tears that you cry over somebody that has died, it's just the love that you didn't get to express while they were here. So it's a way to let love into your life. All the tears that you need to cry over disappointment that you're letting go, that's the baggage and the shame and the kind of beating yourself up that you've been doing for years that's like a backpack that you drag around. It's a way to release that. You focus so much on holding it together and being strong and moving forward and then at the same time, like mounting all this evidence for how things are not working that you're not letting love and joy and connection in. You're protecting yourself from it and you're building a case against it. So many people do this. I did this for so many years too. Um, and, you know, I want you to think about something. Maybe this will help. Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you what to do, Ricky. I can literally, and I will. I'll, tell, I'll give you the domino that you need to tip first that will trigger a ton of other change. And if you just start chipping away at it, we can change absolutely everything. You can lose weight. You can start feeling like you're in your 20s again. You can change your job. You can uh, get support and heal and really do the work to complete and feel present with your dad. You can forgive yourself for whatever you're doing, or you can forgive yourself for how you spent the last 14 years. You can do all that. Mm -hmm. The doing is the easy part. But I want you to have a deeper experience in what you're saying to yourself. And you won't believe it in the beginning. But we got to figure out what you want to believe. And then we're going to list a series of rituals that you're going to do every day that are the actions that a person that believes that their life is amazing, that the best days of their life are ahead, that they deserve to be healthy and happy and vibrant and alive and in love. We got to start mm -hmm. aligning your day-to-day -day actions with the belief that you want to be driving your life.
And so that part's easy. It really is because it's just, here's the shit you need to do. Fucking do it. That's it. Like that, That's change. But there's a deeper breakthrough for you. And I would classify it as letting love in. And I have this visual that I use in my mind because I didn't realize how much I blocked love. Mm-hmm. I like to think about like your heart and your life as having a door, right? That separates you from the rest of the world. And for many, many years, the door between me and my heart and soul and the rest of the world was this like freaking mid-century steel thing that you would see on a castle that is impenetrable, right? Because I didn't trust people. I didn't love myself. I didn't feel like I was worthy. I saw all kinds of reasons why I'd fucked things up, why I was a bad person. And as I've done more and more work to be kinder to myself, to change the story about what I want to experience in life, I've started to convert that door. I did a renovation project. I got rid of that door and I put the kind of doors that you see into a uh, kitchen in a restaurant, you know, that's got the tooth and they swing back and forth because it allows me to be more present to when I'm letting love flow to other people. And more importantly, when I allow the love to flow back to me. Does that resonate mm-hmm. at all with you? Yes and no. Okay. Um, I'll tell you why it, it doesn't. And maybe you can help me with it because maybe okay, it great. does and I'm just not, I'm not seeing it. So I am, and my heart is completely just open for everybody and anyone. Okay. Like when I say that, I'm just like, I'm that friend that's always there. I'm that sister or that person that's always there holding space for everybody else, um, being the rock for everyone else, loving. And not because I don't want to, because I really do. Yep. I really do. Um, and so I give so much love. Um, and I do receive love. I think that I do, but maybe I don't. I don't know. I just You're shaking your head like, no. <laughs> Rocks typically don't allow a lot of love in. And if you're spending a lot of your own energy beating yourself up and feeling disappointed and settling, that's going to block love that everybody has to give to you. No, 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 no. The best days of my life are not ahead. No, 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 no. No, I don't need any help. No, I'm okay. No, you don't have to go with me there. No, I can handle this on my own. Ah, uh, no, I don't look good in this dress. That's not true. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I do that. Me too. Or used to. So what do you think changed when your dad died? Um... I really don't know. I feel maybe I've always wanted to make him proud of me. Mm. Um, And when he died, I felt like I didn't get the chance to do that and that I never will get the chance to do that. Even though he never said that, he never told me he wasn't proud of me. He actually... He, he actually told me before he passed that he was, but I guess I just didn't really believe it because 
I wasn't proud of me. And I just never got the chance to really, yeah, I never got the chance to really show him who I could have been, who I believed I could be. Thank you for going there. That's what happened. You're the one who decided that was the expiration date on you doing and living and being who you want to be. And, you know, there's that term I've seen a lot of people talking about called quiet quitting. It's almost like you quietly quit on your own ambition and your own dreams. And so I want to reclaim that for you, okay? Because you're, what's your dad's name? Joe. Joe. Joe's still here. Mm -hmm. Joe's watching. Joe is proud of you. This isn't Joe's shit. This is your shit. And here's the great news. You do have your entire lifetime to make yourself proud. And Joe's watching. And so your first assignment for me is I want you to write a letter to Joe, your dad. Mm -hmm. And I want you to thank him for being so proud of you. And I want you to tell him that you miss him. And you still feel that he's here. And you thank him for being with you and guiding you. And that you are writing this because you wanted to make a promise to yourself and a promise to him that you are going to go and do some amazing things. In your lifetime. And is he buried somewhere? Yes. Is it close by? Yeah. I want you to go to his grave with the letter and I want you to read it to him. Okay? Yeah. And one of the things I also want you to do is I want you to think back to your 20s. And I want you to think about the things that you were doing in your 20s before your dad died that you don't do now. What are those things? Taking more risks. Great. I was, I was pursuing some creative things. Great. And I don't do that anymore. Okay, great. So creativity. Because what you're going to put in your letter is, and dad, one of the things that I promised to you and to me that I'm going to do is I'm going to bring back what is the creative stuff you used to do, Ricky? Acting. I used to act. And I'm going to sign up for an acting class. I'm going to start going to auditions again. I'm going to join the uh, community theater. I'm going to try out for the uh, summer stock program. Is there anything else that you used to do? Singing. I'm going to start singing. Writing. Great. Writing. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Amazing. That's incredible. And the reason why this is so incredible is because a job change doesn't go deep enough to change what's actually blocking your life force and your happiness. And if I were to have started this conversation by going, hey, you know what you should do? You should just go act. You'd be like, what mm -hmm. the fuck? Get, no. Mm -hmm. But when you can connect it to the fact that there is this vibrancy, this self-expression, this flow and exchange because what's interesting about acting and singing right and writing is it's not just you going out it's the love that comes back in 
mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. castmates and audience and musicians and all the people that are collaborating or witnessing that beautiful self-expression. Mm -hmm. And so that is a perfect pathway for you to change the direction of your life by simply adding in the things that got lost when your life got turned upside down. And I think the act of writing that letter and going to your dad's grave and making a promise to him and to yourself that this is what you're going to put back into your life will be a way bigger deal and a way bigger motivator than any formula that I could ever give you. See, mm -hmm. the research shows that in order for somebody to achieve a goal, a dream, or make a change stick, there are two things that have to be present. You have to have the reason why you're doing it. And you've got to have the way or the how you're going to do it. And you're a smart cookie. You know how to audition. You know how to start singing again whether it's in a church choir or with a group or whatever, you know how to act. You got the way all day long. You got to connect the why back to your dad and back to you mm -hmm. giving yourself permission to be happy and to be proud of yourself. That's your why. And when you marry those two things with the step-by-step -step of just, oh, once a week, I got to go to my singing group. Oh, once a week, I got to audition for some. Oh, once a week, I got We're done here. Mm -hmm. Because if you give yourself permission to do that, it will open up so much momentum and energy that you'll change your job like that you'll start exercising and taking care of yourself. But that's the missing piece. Mm -hmm. You know what I just thought of? What? So it's just like popped into my head. Um, I used to really, really love working out and it never felt like a chore. It was just something I loved to do and I, I would be running. And I, But when I found... Where I found out that my dad had passed away was when I was, ju I just finished a workout mm. and I opened my locker and I checked my phone. And I, so I found out he passed away while I was at the gym. And after that, going to the gym, like, yes, I still went, but it never had the same momentum to it anymore. And I'm just connecting that right now. That is a beautiful insight, a life-changing one. Because mm -hmm. do you remember what happened is, let's go back to that moment. You open up the locker, you mm -hmm. reach in and you grab your phone. Mm -hmm. And how did you learn? There was several messages okay. from my sister that were there. Okay. And so I called back and then she had said to me, I, let's, where are you? I told her I was at the gym and she's like, okay, well, just call me when you get home. And I was like, what's going on? Something in me knew that because he was, he had been in the hospital at the time and something in me, I was just like, just tell me, just tell me, just tell me. And then she had, and then she told me. See, and that, I remember. yes, you remember because that's a traumatic event in your life mm -hmm. and it got married mm -hmm. with something that you love to do. Mm -hmm. So it makes perfect sense that it pulled the ease and the joy out of the thing that you used to love to do. Mm -hmm. But now that you have that incredible self-awareness, I would include that in the letter. Yeah. That, and I know you wouldn't have wanted it and I, me didn't stop doing that. And I didn't either. And I didn't, I, I, I just realized this. And I'm freeing myself of this. And I'm telling you I love you. And thank you for being proud of me. And um, I'm going to start running again every day. I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start living again. 
I get a lot of questions from listeners who, because of the things that have happened in their past, yeah. they don't know how to trust their intuition. Yeah. And I get a lot of questions about decision making and how to truly, in a situation like this, where you are burning through your entire life savings, yeah. you have left your dream job, you have gotten no after no after no after no after no. How do you stay connected to your intuition in a situation like that? Mm -hmm. what, what tool do you have or what advice can you give to somebody who's having trouble hearing what the right decision is mm -hmm. in that kind of situation? Yeah. So I think that intuition is like a muscle that we build mm -hmm. um, over time. And I think it's a lifelong journey that, you know, to really learning how to hear it and to trust it. And one of the greatest tools, I think, is to uh, go back, think back to times in your life where maybe you had this gut feeling to do something and everyone around you said, don't do it. So you listen to them. You didn't trust yourself. And then think about what happened. Right. And then similarly, go back to a time where everyone was like, oh, uh, uh, no way, no way. And you're like, but I love him. I don't think he's lying. I think his <laughs> phone really did break five times every weekend. He didn't disappear his phone. Like, right. Think about like that situation when everyone was telling you something and 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 you didn't listen or even your gut was telling you right and you didn't listen and you think back to those times and you start to develop pattern recognition mm. um of how it felt in moments in your life when you trusted yourself or didn't and what happened and you get better attuned to what that feels like so what does it feel like for you feel, in both situations like can you describe what it feels like for you when you're like yep no that's a no Yes. And what does it feel like for you when you're like, I'm sticking with this? Yeah. Often it's the tiniest of feelings in my gut, right? Some people describe it as like a still small voice. I pray about it. I ask God to give me the answers and I try to live the answers. Do you feel the answers that God gives you? Like, is that what happens for you when you do this? Like right now when I look at you, right? Yeah. Like I know you're a beautiful soul, right? I just know it. You know it. You feel it. Like I feel like you have good, like you're good. You know what I mean? It's a yeah. feeling, right? And, and we get these feelings, but so much around us is so loud, mm. you know? And we just learn over time. And by the way, not to go, this could be a whole other episode, but especially as women from the time we're young, we learn not to trust ourselves. We, we, we walk in to our parents fighting and we go, is everything okay? They're like, everything's great. Everything is great, right? To protect us, we start to learn to You're doubt like, ourselves, baloney. right? Yep, but uh -huh. you know, or, you know, especially as young girls, you learn to make decisions by consensus mm. often with your friends. And or you, making other people happy. Making other people happy. Uh, people pleasing. We're rewarded for, for, for pleasing everyone else and, and almost ignoring what we feel. So, so if you're someone who's an adult right now going, I don't even know how to hear my own gut or trust myself. That's why <laughs> we've been trained out of learning how to do it, right? So it takes intentionality and really um, deciding, oh, you know what? I'm going to put in some time, even if it's five minutes a day, just to thinking about moments in my life where I trusted myself or I didn't. Um, and if you don't remember any of them, start now. You know what you just inspired me to think about? Hmm. I don't even know if it's possible to do this, but imagine if you could go through the rest of today and only make decisions that align with what you truly want. Mm, if yes. you don't want to go to that party tonight, don't go. If a friend asks you something and you feel obligated out of guilt to lend them that thing, don't actually lend them the thing. Yeah. Eat what you want to eat tonight for dinner. Don't just go to wherever your friends want to go. Like, I think that would be a real eye-opening experiment if you were to do that. And you start building that muscle, right? And the more you do that, some, some people don't even pay attention to what they actually want to eat for dinner. They're just like, what sounds good to everyone? But to your point, when you start paying mm -hmm. attention, then you also start building that knowing of hearing your own knowing. Do you think it's possible to discover your unique purpose in life if you are not connected and listening to your intention and in, intuition, I mean? 
and your own intuition. Here's how I think it's, I think it's way more likely and, and, and you're going to actually discover more than one purpose often Mm. if you're really tuned in to your intuition and, and, and you're intentional about it. But what I'll say for someone who feels like they can't hear their gut, but they still want to find their purpose. Um, uh, a friend of mine, Rory Vaden says that your, your, your best position to serve the person you once were right? Um, uh, Trent Shelton, our friend, says says one day the things you're going through right now will be the things you made it through. Yeah. And what I would say to someone listening right now is look at something in the past that has broken your heart, that has caused you grief, that has been something uh, that you care deeply about, whether it's mm-hmm. positive or negative, that you've gone through, something you care deeply about, um, or maybe pain you've gone through, something you have made it through. I believe often when we go through the hardest times in our life, yep. it's for one of two reasons. What are they? It is to either equip us with the strength we need to carry the weight of our success that's to come, mm. to carry the weight of our purpose that's to come, or we've gone through these horrible, unspeakable times, things we would never want to happen to us again in our life because we're actually going to get our greatest source of fulfillment and purpose by one day helping someone else who's going through them. And I love that saying that you're best equipped to help the person you used to be. Yes. Lewis is going to save you. The almost 13 years, was it? How long was Mm -hmm. it? Two decades or whatever of pain that he put himself through Mm -hmm. to get to the wisdom and the greatness that he has unlocked in himself. Because I've known Lewis for five years. He is a different human being. A different human being than even just a year ago. And I think that it is possible, and Lewis will tell you this, to be a competitive motherfucker and to compete at the highest levels, which he Mm -hmm. does. Yeah, I still like to win. Hell hell yes. But it's a win-win. You know, it's it's a different type of win. And to be a calm, Mm -hmm. cool, and confident person Mm -hmm. because you have peace with yourself as you are doing those things. And even just to comment on what you said about paying bills, I don't think you can have financial peace unless you have inner peace. Because there's so many people that you know that have lots of money who are overly stressed. Right. And more money doesn't always solve every problem. Mm-hmm. It solved lots of problems, yep. but it doesn't always solve the problem of accepting and loving yourself. That's true. And I'm going to add something to that because both Lewis and I have been in moments of our life, and ironically it was during 2007 and 2008, where neither one of us were able to buy groceries. Mm-hmm. We did not have any savings. We did not have any income. We were relying on other people to help us get through. And the stress that you feel when you cannot pay for your basic needs is a toxic level of stress that can consume you. But what I also want you to consider is the added stress and shame and mental beatdown that you add on top of that reality doesn't help you pay your bills either. 100%. And so whether you are at a point where you've been wildly successful, but you're deeply unhappy or you're at a point where you're having trouble paying your bills, cultivating a sense of peace inside yourself and assuredness that you can rely on yourself, a steadiness Mm -hmm. so that the world around you does not trip you up emotionally, that that is a superpower. That's Mm -hmm. part of this greatness mindset that you're talking about. And Lewis has been on this profound healing journey. And so I wanna wanna go there. The game is healing. The, the game ga- is the healing. The game is healing in order to, you know, create anything in my mind. What does you know? healing even mean, Lewis? I used to feel a lot of pain in my chest or tightness in my throat or disturbance in my stomach. I used to feel like I couldn't sleep at night because I was up for an hour and a half, like ruminating or thinking and stressed. Mm-hmm. I used to be very reactive when my nervous system was triggered. Yep. I feel like that's that's the opposite of healing. You know, healing is learning how to overcome all those things so your nervous system is in peace when there's chaos around you. It doesn't mean I'm not going to feel triggered momentarily or feel like, oh, I don't like that or react right. to a thing or feel disturbed. But it's learning how to recognize it much faster 
and from a place of integrating healing and lessons, be able to respond differently when there's a disturbance as opposed to based on a wound. So most of my life, I was just reacting, responding based on wounds that I was unaware of. Or maybe I was aware of them, but I was just like, this is who I am. Don't mess with me. You know, oh, like, how many this of is, us have heard that? Yeah, this is, don't try to change me. Don't mess with me. Like, this is who I am. I'm fine. Right. You know, there's nothing wrong with me. Like this like reaction. And um, Can you give people a sense that don't know? You've wrote about this extensively mm-hmm. in your new New York Times bestseller, The Mask of Masculinity. Um, and you talk about this on your podcast, but can you give people a sense of some of the things that needed healing? So I'm going to just point out one of them. So being in a classroom where you cannot do cognitively because of a learning mm-hmm. difference, you and I both have dyslexia, yours seems to be probably more profound than mine. Um, Even reading my own words, I trip up sometimes because I still have to practice like reading slowly and with a cadence. So what was that like for me to pass the book to you? I, I was even going to say it. I was like, you know, this is like, I get to practice my insecurities all the time. I have to read on a teleprompter all the time. And I'm always like, just take a deep breath and know that I just know that I'm not going to be the best reader in the world. And that's okay. And so I just say, you know, I accept myself when I stutter. I accept myself when I stumble. I accept myself when I have to redo a sentence over and over again, because I wasn't able to see what's coming next, and mm. it just didn't sound right. It probably takes me twice as long to read my audiobook as you do, right? <laughs> and uh, and I, I, but I used to hate myself for that and beat myself up, and now I accept and love myself. And when I do that, I notice I read a lot better, and I flow a lot better. And it's the, you know, it's not perfect or anything, but I'm like, it's just I save a lot more time. I'm more relaxed. And as opposed to I used to, to beat myself up and be the biggest critic, now I'm just a positive self-coach in those moments. I'm just like, oh, you got this. Oh, it's okay. You know. You'll Can we it. unpack that for a minute? Because mm-hmm. I think it's a really relatable example. So every one of us has something that we're self-conscious about mm-hmm. or that we beat ourselves up about, whether it's our weight mm-hmm. or like, you know, something about our skin or our hair or our height or... You know, for you, you mentioned stuttering and stumbling and reading out loud or being slower at something. And you so beautifully talked about how you used to just beat the hell out of yourself. You hated mm-hmm. that about yourself. How do you or how did you, Lewis, learn mm. to accept something you hated? How do you fucking do that? There's many different modalities of what worked for you of healing, right? And I and I feel like over the last ten years, I was telling your husband Chris about this. I was like, because he was asking me about all these different things, right? And I was like, I feel like I've tried lots of different stuff because I got a lot of work to do. So I'm willing to <laughs> I'm willing to dive in and like take a look in the mirror and say, tell me what to do, and I'll try it. Um, and I did workshops, emotional intelligence leadership training workshops 10 years ago that helped me unlock and open up about sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. That was kind of stage one. It was one of my biggest shames that I didn't want to talk about. I didn't want anyone to know about because if anyone knew that I'd been sexually abused, I thought no one would ever love me. So it was a huge protection that I was, a shield that I was putting up on myself to show people that I was strong, to show people that I was confident, to show people that I was, that no one could mess with me in sports or whatever it might be. And that, that supported me in accomplishing certain results, but hurt me in feeling loved and harmony and alignment within myself. Mm. And so it was exhausting. It's draining. It's an emotional train wreck because you're kind of living a double life inside. You know, the truth outside Others don't know the truth about you. So you're hiding something. And, you know, I want to point something out about this because we've been doing a whole series on trauma and nervous system repair. And you talked earlier about how your lived experience, even though you're super successful on the outside, is like not in the stomach, tightness in the chest, something in the throat. You don't even have to be conscious about the fact that you're hiding this thing. It's not like you're walking around thinking about the fact that you were a victim of sexual abuse, it's that it's stored in your body. So your body operates in a state all the time as if something bad's about to happen. I wasn't even like aware that I wasn't telling people. I was just like, you know, trying to block it and, and, and cover it up constantly. But it was always in my mind. Mm. Like maybe every few days the memory would come up in some way. It was just like a movie that was repeating on, on repeat. And, 
when I did this first workshop, a lot of things started to happen in my life where I was having breakdowns, intimate relationship, business partnership, just life. I just felt like, man, stuff is breaking down all around me. Although I'm successful, why are all these things breaking down? I'm the common denominator. A friend of mine was like, I actually got in a fight on a basketball court. This was kind of the tipping point where I was the perfect storm. And a friend of mine who was there was like, I don't want to hang out with you anymore if you're going to keep reacting in this way. Because I was the same fun-loving guy, but when I would get triggered, I was like, this reaction would come out of me. Like you get like super physical, like a linebacker kind I would of just thing? like def- try to defend myself energetically. But if someone was physically trying to attack me, which in a basketball game is kind of a, uh, you know. Isn't that part of the game? Yes, but I would take it so personally. So when there was a cheap elbow, I'd be like, turn around and be like, let's go, let's fight. So I didn't have the filter because I felt like someone was always trying to abuse me or take well, advantage of me. Because they had. Exactly. And so this was kind of the, the, the last thing that happened. I got in this fight and my friend was like, hey, I don't want to hang out with you. I don't want to play basketball anymore with you if you're going to react like this. And it was a tendency that was happening for many months more and more until this like fist fight came Fist about. fight? Fist fight. On yeah. a basketball court? On a pickup basketball <laughs> court. Yeah. There was no stakes on the line. It was just like a friendly game in the mean streets of Beverly Hills. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, how old were you? I was 10 years ago. Yeah. So how old are you now? I'm 39. 30. So So when you're 29 years old. And I remember there was a police station right across the street. It was in West Hollywood. It was 10 minutes away from here. And, um, and I remember going home after this. Well, I remember seeing the guy's face when it was done and being really scared of what I had done. Meaning his face didn't look good. I'll just say that. And he, and I always had this rule that I'll never hit someone unless they hit me first. That was kind of like my thing, but I'll, I'll freaking get in someone's face. I'll talk trash, whatever. But I was like, I'll never hit someone unless they hit me first. He ended up headbutting me because we were like kind of in each other's faces and he headbutts me. And then I kind of just go blank and I, and I turn into like the incredible Hulk in that moment. Like this guy hit me. There's no rules. And, um, and afterwards I had so much adrenaline uh, cause I don't think I'd gotten in an actual fight since I was like 13. Right. So I played football to get my aggression out, but then no, I no longer was able to hit people legally. Right. <laughs> and so this was a point where this happened. And I remember going home and looking at myself in, in the mirror and being like, who are you? I did not recognize myself. And I really, was really kind of like shaking. Cause I was like, what am I doing? Like, who am I? What are you, why are you reacting? I always started to like ask myself this question. And I remember thinking like, I have too much to lose now Hmm. to allow my anger, my fears, my wounds to be in control. Yeah. Because I had built a business and I was like, what if someone, I don't know, what if someone had a knife or a gun or whatever, like, or I injured myself in a worse way or I hurt someone else. Like what if something really bad happened? He was ended up fine. We were fine. But I remember thinking, oh, okay, this could really get out of control. And this was nothing. This was like a little incident. And I was so reactive. So that's what got me down the path of saying, let me take a look in the mirror. I asked some friends for some some suggestions on what I could do. I went to some workshops. The first workshop I went to got me to a vulnerable enough state to talk about sexual abuse for the first time. That out loud? Out loud. First wow. time I spoke the words. What was that like? The most terrifying moment of my life to be honest because i never thought that this had happened to any other man so you have to imagine if you think that not what has happened to you has never happened to anyone else then you think you are wrong broken and the worst human being alive yeah. now that's just it was my interpretation right and i got to a place during this workshop where it was a five-day experience and a lot of people were going through about it's a leadership workshop, but we have to go into our past and mend things to get clear on what we want for the future and then move towards the future, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like a process, a journey of your personal life to help you have more tools of leadership. Yeah. And at one point during this workshop, people were open up about different stuff. It was a vulnerable state at this time, but it was like after the third day. The trainer goes, okay, we've gone into these different past experiences parents and this and that and breakups we're not talking about the past anymore we're moving on we're going into what you want to create for the future like we're done we're moving forward but if there's anything you haven't shared 
now is the time. Like if there's anything you haven't shared from the past, now is the time or we're moving on and you're going to miss your moment. For whatever reason, that voice came back out and was like, okay. And during this time, I started to address all these different things from my childhood. My parents, you know, uh, they probably should have never been married in the first place, but they yeah. went through a divorce eventually and just kind of the fear of their arguments and fights mm -hmm. as a, a young child. That was stressful. My brother went to prison when I was eight for four and a half years. Uh, so I didn't have friends for four and a half years because in a small town, um, you know, the moms wouldn't let their kids hang out with me. So that was just a lonely time and it was traumatic to go to a prison of every weekend and watch your brother in a, in a room full of convicts and their families. It was a traumatic experience for the whole family. Um, you know, being picked on in school and special needs classes and all these different things, breakups, heartbreak. I was like, okay, I've already addressed this stuff. I feel fine here. But what about this thing that I've been thinking about almost every day for 25 years? And whatever inside of me just said, you have to stand up. And I remember just like standing up and getting out of my seat and walking to the front of the room. And there's probably, I don't know, 30, 40 people in the room were kind of like in a semi-circle and I stand up. And this was interesting because I couldn't look anyone in the eyes. I stood up, I like looked down at the carpet, went in front of the room and just said when I was five, I was sexually abused by the babysitter's son. And I went through the entire story of the entire event. It was almost like I was in the bathroom again, reliving it. And I shared this, but I could not look up because I was so ashamed at what I was saying. And I was just thinking to myself, man, everyone's laughing at me. Everyone's like, you know, thinking I'm a loser. Everyone thinking I'm unlovable. All these things came up for me and I was like, my life is over. It's essentially what I was thinking. And I remember sharing this, staring down, like walk through the whole thing. Um, and somehow I was like semi calm. I was like standing there just maybe cause I wasn't looking in anyone's mm -hmm. eyes, but I was pretty calm and able to just get through it. I wasn't crying or anything. I was just getting through it. And then I went and sat down and there was two women <laughs> sitting on either side of me when I sat down and I remember just looking at one of them and she's like weeping. And the other one is like holding me. They're crying. Now it's like, 25 years of pain just kind of erupts and I start crying and they're holding me. They're, they're all kind of like jumping and shaking. Like, you know, they're crying uncontrollably and I'm just like, I have to leave. So I run out of the room. It was in kind of a conference room of like a hotel, run out of the hotel to get some fresh air. And I'm in the back alley behind this hotel by LAX. And there's a wall. I kind of just put my hand against the wall and I'm just like sobbing. And a few minutes later, I feel a touch on the back of my shoulder, and it's this guy who's bigger than me. He's probably in his late 50s, and he turns me around. He's crying. He looks me in my eyes. He says, you're my hero. You're my hero. I will follow you anywhere. I vividly remember this. He goes, I have three kids. I've been married for 20-something years. My wife doesn't know. My kids don't know. This happened to me when I was 11. This happened to me multiple times. And I've lived with shame and doubt and insecurities my whole life. Thank you for being the first person to open up in front of me. You're going to give me the courage now to go and tell my wife. Wow. All these men from the room started coming out. There was only a two or three guys who had been sexually abused that told me that for the first time, by the way. They hadn't opened up either to anyone in their lives. And then other guys were just like, I've never heard anything like this. This happened to me. I feel really insecure about this in my life or this thing I'm ashamed of, right? right. And it was so powerful because I was thinking, all these, everyone's going to make fun of me. But in fact, it made them trust me and respect me more and love me more. The thing that was the scariest thing for me was actually the thing that, that brought me closer to people. Mm. And, and people could actually see me for the first time fully, at least in that regard. Um, and it was, that was the start of 10 years of lots of different healing modalities, which I'm happy to talk about some of them, but it was, uh, that was the start of processing the healing. The next step is integrating the healing, which is where all the work is. Yeah, that's true. Well, we will get you back to go in and talk about all the modalities, but I want to just say that this is yet another one of those areas where you and I have a parallel path because I had a very similar thing happen to me when I was in the fourth grade 
and I buried it. Mm. And I knew in the back of my mind, somewhere in the back of my mind, that something had happened. And it wasn't until I was at a leadership seminar. Really? That was in the you started personal de- No, well, what happened is somebody else shared. And they uh-huh. shared about how it had ha- they had been molested and they had forgiven their parents and forgiven the babysitter, mm-hmm. but they couldn't forgive their sister because while this was happening to them in the bathroom, similar to their story, their sister was watching TV. Oh. And as she said that, I had a very vivid memory of the moment that it happened to me in the middle of the night. And when I kind of rolled over because I you know, was scared that this person was on top of me, the first person I saw was my brother because he was sleeping on the bunk bed like right across. And I thought, I don't want this person to hurt him. So I was just like quiet oh, wow. like a mouse. But it was the sibling connection. And it, like you, just flooded in. Wow. And I was like, I got to share this. And for a minute, I questioned whether or not it had happened. Mm. And it was, was it speaking- a bad dream or was it a reality yes. or was, did I block it? Was it real? Yeah. Yes. But that voice, that knowing, that flood of emotion yeah. made me, like you, say, I, I, I just have to say it out loud. And, and, what, and what happened when you said it out loud? Oh, I just collapsed sobbing same Mm. thing as you like so many people come up i mean it is such unfortunately a very common story one in four women one in Mm. six Mm -hmm. men have experienced something like that but it's in the either the the denying that it's real and questioning it or the shame that you feel around it as if somehow it's your fault yeah or it somehow is damaging to you and carrying that inside which really is damaging and Mm -hmm. so i think that it's an it's an important thank you first of all for sharing Mm -hmm. that story yeah of course um and i think speaking the things that you hate or are ashamed of is a form of acceptance Mm -hmm. because if you keep this stuff silent if you're unwilling to talk about it it's going to continue to haunt you so you know, you've been on this incredible mm-hmm. journey of healing. What has it taught you about greatness? You can't be great without having peace and without going on a healing journey, in my mind. You can accomplish a lot. You can achieve a lot. You can get a lot of awards and make a lot of money. But I feel like if you feel like you don't are still aren't enough, then you're not great, I don't think. Because really it's the think enough, so. the thing that you're chasing is outside of you. It is outside of you. And again, I was chasing them to feel better about myself, to feel like, okay, I matter and I have value because I didn't believe I had value. And I think um, once you believe you have value, then you're creating from a space of love and win-win and service as opposed to, I need to do this for me and look good and feel something up inside of me. You're doing it from a more healing journey uh, place, and then you're able to give more. You're able to create in a better place. So a lot of my life was doing things to prove people wrong mm. that I felt abused, abandoned, made fun of by. It's like, well, let me go make, create, succeed to prove people wrong. Mm. So when I would lose, I was a bad loser because I was like, oh, I didn't prove them wrong. I lost. They were right. And so it was just a different energy of creation. It's the second most powerful fuel is the fuel of anger and not enoughness. Right. You can go nonstop for years trying to prove your enoughness from that state, but it is exhausting energy. It's draining. It's like, you feel like, oh, what was the point of this? So many times I accomplish things in sports, biggest dreams after 10 and 15 years of thinking about them, working hard and accomplishing it and feeling like, so angry after I accomplished it because I thought I would feel something different Mm. and I still didn't feel good enough. So I was like, I need to go create more and accomplish more. And then I would do it. And I was like, why am I still feeling alone inside? It's because I didn't have a good relationship with me internally. And once I started to shift that, I just feel such a good sense of peace. And because I have a meaningful mission that is not about me, it's about others as well. And you so talk when, about mission in this book. And I a think lot. that's the foundation. It's like getting clear on a meaningful mission that How it's do not about. How do you do that? Uh, I mean, it's I mean a, you've got you've got the framework in here, yeah, but but I'm, I'm trying I'm thinking, Lewis, about the person. It depends on the season of your life. And again, if you are trying to pay your bills, you can't think about a meaningful mission. You gotta think about 
protecting yourself, safety, and getting to a place of financial Well, that's financial a meaningful stability. mission, right? And that is a meaningful mission for this season, right? Okay. So when I was on my sister's couch, that's all I could think about. was like, how can I make enough money to get off the couch? Great. And so that was the mission for that season. But once you complete that, you got to think about something bigger that includes others, right? And so I was still including others in that by adding value to people in order to get money from them, right? Essentially, I'm going to give you a service, I'm going to help you, and you're going to pay me. Right. So I'm helping them overcome a problem. And I was using my my passion and my power to solve a problem. And that's what I started to do. And then I started to, once I, once I overcame that mission or accomplished it, I was like, okay, now I can see a little bit further. Now what do I want to create? And the same thing happened with the School of Greatness. Once now, so they, hold on. I just yeah. want to tell everybody. So Lewis basically, in looking for a job, figured out how LinkedIn worked. Exactly. And then realized, oh, whoa, I can teach other people uh -huh. how to use LinkedIn like a pro. And so he literally became wildly successful being an expert on monetizing and utilizing yeah. LinkedIn and one platform. And tell everybody how you came up with the School for Greatness idea. So after, I don't know, four or five years of, of kind of teaching LinkedIn and then expanding it into just social media and marketing in general and courses and stuff like that, I realized, okay, I had enough money for maybe two years to live. Oh, that's and, pretty damn good, Lewis. When you're broke and poor, uh, at that least from my like point of view. the I, holy grail. When you're broke and poor, from my point of view, I didn't spend anything. I was like, I just need to stack everything because yep. I was in scarcity mode. Yep. So I wasn't like spending anything. So I had enough. And I also didn't have a car. You know, I was living in like an apartment that was only $495 a month. I was like living in the, the lowest amount I could. I was like taking trains places, not like flying anywhere. I was like, how can I This save? is Lewis the Squirrel. Yes, yes I Ordering was a squirrel, his nuts, trying man. to get Here nuts we go. everywhere. That's put right. Him in, <laughs> put him in my back pocket. And um, and once I realized, oh, I can actually like, I'm surviving now, right? I'm, I'm thriving, I'm surviving. I got out of this kind of like scarcity mentality. Yeah. I was able to think beyond that. I was able to think beyond this like need to like just make money really quickly. And... Um, I realized I didn't want this anymore. This season of life, I was like, I don't want to do what I was doing in this business anymore. So I sold it to a business partner that I had. And I was like, okay, I've got about two years of cash if I don't make any money to survive. Yep. This is the exact moment when I got into the fight in the basketball court. I was going through a breakup in a relationship that I moved to LA for. And uh, I was just having breakdowns in life. And so I was literally stuck in traffic in LA a little over 10 years ago. Tuesday next week is my 10 year anniversary for my podcast. No way. Tuesday next week. So a little over 10 years ago, maybe 10 years and three months ago, I'm stuck in LA traffic. All this stuff had just happened. And I'm just thinking to myself, man, I've, I don't have it all figured out. I thought I did. I thought my ego knew it was right. Yeah. I thought I, you know, accomplished stuff and this and that and was featured in the White House and all these other things. I was like, man, I should be the man, but I feel like a loser. And I was stuck in LA traffic. We were literally on the 405 and um, we were not moving. And all these people around me in cars stopped, were screaming and honking and flipping each other off. <laughs> and I'm honking and I'm like, man, I'm stuck. We're stuck. Everyone's stuck. And I was just like, okay, huh. If people are stuck in traffic and they're taking them so long to get places, what if I could offer value and solve a problem for them to get unstuck? This was literally what I was going through. And I was like, I need the solution myself. And I just started hearing about, hearing about podcasting. This was um, 2012. I just started to hear like just whispers, you know, whisper, oh, podcasting, what is this thing, right? And I was like, I literally called two friends in the car. It was a long drive, being stuck. I called two friends. I go, I know you have a podcast. I just saw you launch Who this thing. Who were they? Pat Flynn and my friend Derek Halpern. Okay. Called them both. And uh, I go, tell me about the podcasting thing. And they were like, I love it. It's the coolest thing ever. I, the audience I'm connecting, the building, the relationship, it's the best thing ever. I don't make any money, but it's the best <laughs> thing ever. And I was like, okay, cool. And I was like, man, I think I could do this because I had started to just interview people for myself, mm. recording it for me like business leaders and sports athletes and all these people for years leading up to that. That's how I got in kind of the LinkedIn space. I would network with people, I'd interview them. 
And I just was like, man, I've learned so much from these people which got me here in my business results. So let me take it a step farther. And they were both telling me like, well, you should just make it about like marketing and entrepreneurship because that's what you're doing. Right. I was like, ah, it just doesn't resonate with me. I feel like I'm supposed to do something more. And they're like, well, don't go too broad because it probably won't work. Oh, you mean like greatness? Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> and who are you? You're still just like getting started. You're like an internet marketer. You don't have a big audience. Like you can't go too broad. You just beat somebody up on a basketball court. I know, right. I mean, like you're, you're breaking down everywhere in your life. And I was just like, <laughs> again, that voice kept saying like, I just feel like this is what I want to step into though. Mm. And even if it fails, I'm going to make it an experiment. I'm going to do it for one year, one episode a week for a year and just see if I like it. So I discovered the mission by exploring something, by being curious and trying it. And I gave myself some parameters. I'm not going to try to make money. Again, at that time, I had money for two years. Got so it. Some people may not have that luxury right. when they're figuring this out in terms of making money. You might have to make money really quickly. If I needed to make money, I could have. Well, you also don't have to go all in. Exactly. What I loved about what you said, did, I, did you hear what Lewis said? Experiment. He mm -hmm. gave himself permission to experiment with something for a year. Number two, he took the pressure off and said, I'm not going to make this experiment generate money. Mm -hmm. And so if you can, whether you're on the couch or you're working a job, if you can give yourself the grace of an experiment mm -hmm. and take the pressure off of money, yeah. you now are walking in the footsteps of greatness here. Mm -hmm. And so you set out on this experiment. And you didn't yeah. know shit about how to do it. I you have no two clue. friends that... I had an iPhone that I used to record in the beginning. I had no clue what I was doing. I was, you know, I was trying to do what I thought I was supposed to do. I was just like trying stuff. And my, it's funny because my assistant listened to the first episode like last week. She goes, I went back and listened to the first episode. She goes, you're a completely different person. And I'm like, because it was more about success, mm -hmm. right? It was more about like achievement and winning and like results. Oh, I have to go back and listen now. It's like, you, Lewis. We right. might have to pop in a little right. audio of Lewis the, introducing exactly. himself. Exactly. <laughs> then after, then I went to this workshop a few months later. Oh, and the I one where you spoke up for about, the first time? Yeah, about sexual abuse and all these things. And I actually, this is so funny, I actually learned the concept about no one wins. Or you don't win unless everyone wins around you. You know, that was like, what? That concept didn't make sense to me as an athlete. I was like, no, there was one winner. Everyone else must lose. Otherwise, you're the loser, right? That was kind of like the mentality that I was, I was trained with. Right. It was the programming that I was conditioned to have. And this workshop taught me that you don't win unless everyone wins. You embody that, dude. And it, and it is about, and it, thank you. And it's about, it doesn't mean, you know, Winning could look differently for everyone around you, but there must be like a win-win experience. Otherwise, your win doesn't mean as much if, if others aren't improving and growing and succeeding in whatever it is they're doing as well, right? It doesn't mean it has to be equal winning or something like that. And that's why I was like, yeah, that's right. This, this podcast can't be about like results. It should be about elevating others and about improvement and how we can all win together. Hmm. And that's when it started to shift and I started to like, be a little softer and be less like, let's just get results, you know? And, um, and it was beautiful. So there's there so much that happened in that first year of the experiment where I started to like try something and it, and it wasn't perfect the first hundred times. I, I just said, how can I make it better every time? How can I listen to the feedback and make it better every time? And, um, and how can I find my voice in this process? You know, even if I'm not comfortable sharing my voice, how do I find it by practicing it? Mm. And after the first year, I remember um, being like, man, I just really loved this and enjoyed it. And so 10 years later, here we are. I still love it. still enjoy wow. it. Wow. When you think back on literally probably thousands of people that you've interviewed, mm -hmm. what's one interview that you reflect on the most? I was going to say Kobe because he was my favorite interview. But when you said this, um, there was an interview the first year that I had with a guy named Chris Lee, who is the actual coach and trainer of the workshop I went to when I opened up for the first time. Really? He had such a massive impact on me from that experience that I ended up hiring him as a coach for a couple of years just to like coach me personally. Mm. And I had him come on the show and I had him put me through, well, I guess he put me through it, but I asked him about like, I was single at the time. I go, how do you find the dream like partner? 
And he put me through a guided meditation where he had me close my eyes. And he like walked me through a scenario and a scene of my future self. He said, I want you to imagine waking up next to this person. I want you to imagine what they look like, what they sound like. I want you to imagine what you, when you open the windows, where you are in the world, what your view is. I want you to imagine the feeling, the experience you're having with this person. And um, the reason I'm talking about that is because I said to myself during that, my eyes were closed, I was like, <laughs> I don't know if this was weird or not, but I was like, I wake up next to the woman of my dreams, and when I open my eyes, she looks at me and she's smiling at me every morning. And I remember saying that. I don't know why that came to me, but I was like, she, she looks at me, she's smiling at me because she's so grateful and happy that we're in this relationship together. And essentially eight years later, I'm in a relationship with a person that wakes up, that literally opens her eyes and looks at me and smiles. And this is no joke. It happens every day. She looks at me, she hugs me. Some days she wakes up crying, I'm not kidding because she's just a grateful human being, not just because of like, I'm in her life, but she's just a happy person. And I dreamt of this. And so for me, that was a powerful, powerful episode because I had two other relationships before her and after this conversation. Those, those things didn't happen. And I realized that it only happened the moment I started to fully heal a lot of the emotional things that I still wasn't ready to face in intimacy. Mm. So I healed one element, but not all the other elements. And it wasn't until I, I, literally there was a pain in my chest for still for years from other things, not the sexual abuse pain, because I could talk about that freely and be right. at peace. But in other things that I still wasn't willing to face, and it wasn't until I faced those things two years ago, there was a pain in my chest for many years that would come and go, it disintegrated after about five months of intensive therapy, integration, healing. It finally disintegrated in my chest and I felt this ball of pain go throughout my body into like complete freedom. And it hasn't come back since. Wow. It took five months of intense reflection, exercises, practicing of healing the nervous system mm -hmm. to where that went away. Mm -hmm. That is literally a month or two later, I met her. Wow. And it's been a game changer ever since. Have you talked publicly about what that thing was that you faced? I just started, I haven't really talked about it publicly. I just started kind of telling people that, because I don't know if other people feel a pain in their chest. I don't know if, if you've ever felt like a ball that's kind of like this, not palpitations, but just kind of a nagging pain. I think people feel the, I feel it more kind of like right above the stomach. Yeah. That's sort of where my... And I know when it's coming because it hits the ankles first and then this clinches. Yep. Like wobbly legs or something? No, no like I feel literally the tr when I get triggered, I literally feel it start. And it comes to your stomach. Yeah, but I think you want to know why. It's because that's how the person approached oh, me. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah, I because it was used to be the throat and the chest for me. Mm -hmm. I just feel like I couldn't speak. Yeah. And there was like a pain here. And I was just like, it wasn't like I felt like I was having a heart attack or anything like that, but it's just like a nagging pain. Yeah. It would come and go, and I couldn't figure out how to get rid of it or how to like eliminate it. And it just, I went to five months of intensive every week therapy, sometimes five, six hours on Saturdays, where I was just like, I'm a maniac on a mission to create peace, clarity, and freedom. The first day I stepped into therapy with the, my coach, I call her an emotional coach because I think we should all have one. She said, what's your intention for starting this process? I said, I want peace, clarity, and freedom because I didn't feel like I had e any of those. Can I take a guess at what your biggest block was? Sure. It was an inability to even allow love in. Is that what it was? I don't know if that's what it was. Maybe, but it was my inability to not abandon myself. What does that mean for somebody who's never heard that term? So it was my inability to, to not abandon myself in intimacy with one person, the person that I was choosing to be in a committed relationship with. Because I wanted to abandon myself in other areas. Mm. I would stand up for, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Oh, for you like a nice guy doormat type in relationships? I was more trying to buy peace. So whenever my relationship, what, uh, oh. relationships in the past would try to, would be upset at me. Yeah. You didn't do this. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll go do it now. 
Yeah. Whenever there was disturbance emotionally. Yes. You for the through? environment, or they were screaming at me, or they were cold shoulder, or they wouldn't speak to me. Mm-hmm. I was like, I don't like this feeling. And so I didn't know how to navigate my inner world when that would happen. I didn't know how to be peaceful under chaos emotionally. So I would do things to buy peace. I would say, okay, I'll stop doing this. Even though I don't want to stop doing something, yeah. I'll stop doing it to make you feel comfortable. Yeah. Okay, I'll give in here. Okay, I'll, I'll come home five hours early. Okay, I won't go on that trip because you don't feel comfortable with me going alone. See, I don't think people understand how much men struggle with this. That, that no, I, I mean it. Like, you're, you, this is why I said you remind me a tremendous amount in mm. ways of Chris. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Like, just would shut down. Yeah. And Or give in. Or, or give in yeah. and not capable of expressing what he needed because his experience as a kid was it didn't matter anyway. Exactly. And a lot a lot of times, you know, in general, a lot of men were never trained on how to navigate uncomfortable emotions through their highest selves. They would navigate it through their ego self, which is to defend, protect, and show that everything's okay. And that works in some cases, but not in every case. And I think I didn't have the tools, the training, the knowledge, the experience, the wisdom on how to navigate stressful emotions in love, in an intimate, loving relationship. Mm. I could do it in business and sports and what other things. What was it modeled for you? It wasn't modeled for little. me. Yeah, it was constant. It was a constant low level stress and like resentment from my parents of each other, which yeah. made me always like, ah, what's going to happen, right? And they loved me and I, and I knew they loved me, but it was, I knew they also didn't love each other. Yeah. And so that was stressful. Um, and so I didn't know how to how to be with a woman who was like, you can't do this, screaming at me, don't do this. I don't like when you do this. This is not okay, blah, 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 blah. Because what they are saying is you're not enough. And I don't accept you for who you are, Lewis. Mm. So I didn't accept myself for who I was. I, I, knew, I knew I wasn't enough, that's how I thought. So I said, I'm gonna do what's gonna make her feel like I'm enough for her. Right. And after a year, two years, three years of doing that and just giving in and giving in and giving in, you fully lose yourself. Yes. You lose all your, you, you lose who you are. And then you get resentful, you get frustrated, you get angry. So I lacked the emotional ability to say no. And if you don't love me and accept me and you want to walk away, that's okay. And I lacked the emotional ability to, um, to just be okay with me walking away from something as well. And that's why when I met Martha, uh, which you've met her oh, a couple she, of times now. She smiles at you all the time. I had a, I had a, a fully different experience. Because, because you were different. Because I was completely different. And, and I just told her like straight up, I was like, this is my values, this is who I am, and I'm never going to abandon myself for anyone. Mm-hmm. You, this, that, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm just never going to abandon myself. You know, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be a flexible human being and supportive in all these other ways, but I'm not going to give up who I am to please one human being because they're not happy with me. Dude, if you could sum up the greatness mindset, I think you just did. There is this quote that goes viral all the time. I have no idea who said it first, but it's that thing that when you uh, put all your energy into trying to keep the peace with others, you create a war oh, inside yourself. That's and good. that is just what you described. Yeah. That tension in your chest, and so many of you listening listen with it, or that pit in your stomach is the war mm-hmm. that Lewis just described with yourself because you're so much more focused and concerned with keeping the peace, making sure everybody else is okay. And until you invert that mm-hmm. and you focus on creating peace within yourself, that's it right there. And this is the moment when it unlocked. I remember now exactly what happens when this the pain went away because I was working on, because I didn't feel free, right? And so for five months of therapy going in every week, I was committed. I was like, I'm going to figure this out and I'll go as long as it takes um, You're like a truffle pig for healing. I was like, he's got to root yeah, yeah. that thing out exactly. right there. I'm doing it, man. I'm and not going to stop until I am healed. I, I love that. I'm I remember, proud of you. And, I'm, and healing is a journey. It's not an event that happens overnight. Right. There's an unlocking. There's an awareness moments. But then you've got to then PTSD occurs if you don't keep integrating it. Yeah. So it's a constant. So journey. what was that moment? So the moment was many because every time I would meet my coach, she'd say, "What's your intention? Peace, clarity, freedom." Okay. I didn't feel them. 
And so we were talking about what each one is. When do you not feel peace? When do you not feel clear? Freedom. And I was like, I've never felt free in my life. And a lot of it came down to modeling parents. They weren't free in their relationship. Mm. They both were resentful of being in the relationship. They both got married when they were 19. They didn't know any better. Yeah. They had four kids. They were working their butts off, just staying together. So I don't blame them, but they stayed together, not because they wanted to, because they didn't know how to how to navigate it as well. And so I saw them trapped. That was what it was for me. I saw them trapped and I was afraid to be trapped because I didn't want to repeat the feeling of them being trapped and feeling miserable a lot mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't want to create that in my life, but I didn't know how to stand up for myself. So that was the thing. And she just kept looking at me. It was kind of like a goodwill hunting moment. She was like, you're not trapped. You're not trapped. You're not trapped. You're a free man. You're a free man. You're a free man. And I don't know what it, it was just like all the months of like the practicing, the integrating, the, the opening it back up, where it's just kind of like this like rush. It like finally connected to me that I am a free man, that I am not trapped. She was like, you can walk away at any moment. You can walk away at any moment. You don't have to keep working in this relationship. Like especially since you're not married, you don't have to walk, you can walk away at any moment. But even if you are married, you're you can walk away. And that was the thing. I was like, I'm so afraid to get married because I don't want to have the shame of getting divorced mm. or the pain that caught that, that happens after divorce that so many people go through. Well, it's so interesting. You were so focused on not feeling trapped that you actually trapped yourself. hundred percent. And it's so funny because I went to a prison almost every week for four, four and a half years and I watched men who were trapped behind bars. But some of them were emotionally free. Mm. Some of them were there, but I saw them free men. Like they were in a state of complete peace. Not all of them, but some of them had so much love in their hearts, were very kind and generous. They had their families around and they were free emotionally, but they just did something that put them in there physically. Mm. And I realized for so long that I was trapped emotionally, but free physically, and mm. I didn't know how to break free. And that was the thing where I was like, I'm just sick and tired of feeling this pain. I'm sick and tired of repeating the pattern where yeah. I'm the common denominator in all these relationships, choosing them, staying in them, and not standing up for myself. So that was a massive game changer for me, was investing in emotional coaching, showing up consistently when I didn't want to, and doing the work. And I think a lot of us will get business coaches, career coaches, health coaches, but the emotional game is the game that most of us don't know how to master, and yet we we won't invest in coaching or find support, and I just think it's so crucial. Well, you write at the very end of your fantastic book, The Greatness Mindset. You're talking about unlock the power of your mind and live your best life today. You have a huge section in this on healing. A whole section is healing. I feel like you cannot no, be huge great. huge section. I feel like, like you can't be great unless you heal. of the book yeah. is healing. Like, I feel like it's not even unlock the power of your mind. It's literally unlock the power of your mind, body, and spirit. Well, integrate every, it all. Well, you know everything's a Trojan horse. So well, uh, that's gotta, true. You bring people Nobody's going to pick up the healing book. So they're yes, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exactly. buy the mindset book. But guys, if people understood the art of falling in love with yourself, the world would be a much better place. Mm -hmm. Lewis, the world is a much better place because you're in mm -hmm. it. Thank you, Mel. Oh my gosh, Oak, I almost forgot the most important habit that helps with self-love and self-acceptance, and that's the high five habit. All right, I'm going to explain it. The high five habit, super simple. Don't overthink this. I will do an entire episode about the high five habit probably in January because there's so much science to cover and so many stories to tell you. It's also the subject of my New York Times bestselling book called The High Five Habit. But let me just tell you what this habit is because it is the thing you need to know based on science and research to have a breakthrough in self-acceptance and self-love. Here it is. Tomorrow morning, after you finish brushing your teeth, put the toothbrush down and now I want you to do the high five habit and this is how you do it. First, you look in the mirror. For many of you, that's going to be the hardest part. 50% of men and women, based on our research, cannot or will not look themselves in the mirror because they do not like the person they see. That is sad. And so I don't want you to be surprised if simply looking at yourself in the mirror is really difficult. Step two, you are then going to raise your hand and high five your reflection. I know, it sounds dumb. 
It sounds stupid. Why would somebody do that? I'll tell you why somebody would do that in a later episode because the science will is so profound. The neuroscience, the research on motivation, the research on mindset, the research on how uh, the dopamine gets really, it's just unbelievable what happens when you simply high five yourself in the mirror. I just want you to practice it and trust me on this one. Now, let me tell you what's going to happen. When you go to raise your hand, I don't want you to say anything. Nothing. It's just about the action and watching yourself high five yourself. The action alone of high fiving yourself does all the work neurologically, physiologically, chemically, and psychologically. It will take less than five days for you to have a breakthrough in self love if you simply look in the mirror every morning and send yourself into your day by high fiving yourself in the mirror. You may laugh. The reason why you laugh is because your brain releases dopamine. This is really normal. You might burst into tears. That's also very normal because you may not have looked at yourself for real or been kind to yourself for real in years. Many, many people are super surprised by how emotional they get by simply silently high-fiving themselves every morning in the mirror. If you have this visceral, that's the stupidest thing, I really want you to do it. Because not being willing to simply try something that I'm telling you, we've had 164,000 people in 91 countries go through a five-day challenge with me called the High Five Challenge. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And the results are just irrefutable. This is the fastest way based on science to start rewiring your brain and to have a breakthrough in being kind and loving to yourself. And it works at a reprogramming level in your nervous system and in your brain. And it's all in the book. But I just want you to trust me on this. And so the best way to do this is let me coach you and support you because I have developed a free, that's right, no money, nothing to buy, free five-day challenge. It's called the High Five Challenge, H-I-G-H, the number five challenge, H-I-G-H, the number five challenge, highfivechallenge.com. Register for free. If you want a true breakthrough in how you speak to yourself, how you feel about yourself, loving yourself, this is the fastest way to do it, and I would love to coach you. So, High Five Challenge, I'll see you in it. All right, Oakley, thank you for letting me do that. Um, let's bring it home. Welcome back. Nice energy. Yeah, good energy. So I'm back with my husband, Chris. Hi, Mel. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Of course. And I was just sharing with everybody that when I first stumbled upon this high five habit and I started doing it, and then I asked you if you would try it for five days, do you remember that? Definitely. And I said, NFW. <laughs> Well, you did have a very deliberate, I'm not doing that. Yeah, I, I immediately thought it was the dumbest idea ever. I found it ludicrous, quite honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the mirror. Let's high five ourselves. And this is going to solve all problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not saying it's going to solve all problems, but I know based on the research and I know based on the testimonials of uh, 175,000 people and the testimonials that roll in every single freaking day that are so profound that when you take on this habit, it has a shocking impact on your brain and how you see yourself and the person in the mirror. And that kicks open a door to an entirely new set of habits and an entirely new possibility. And, you know, we're laughing, but when I kept pushing you, because I'm like, dude, you're my husband. I need you to try this. I want you to take the high five challenge. I want you to do this for five days. You shared with me something that I didn't know. And the real reason why you thought this was stupid when you dug a little deeper, it was really sad. And honestly, it was scary to hear as your spouse. So would you share with everybody sort of the deeper insight as to why you kind of had that reaction? I think uh, at the time I related to the idea of a f high five to myself as being encouragement, like looking forward, the, the, 
the idea that you would high five yourself to uh, inspire forward action. And yet I find that the power of that high five in the mirror is less your hand meeting the mirror and more your eyes meeting your eyes. And that's where the struggle was. Because when I took that challenge on, I remember really um, the high five was easy. The looking at myself in the mirror, that was not easy. Why? Can I hold your hand? <laughs> I think it was not easy because there was so much reflection on the past. You know, I was looking back. I was not, um, I was not seeing somebody that deserved a high five. I saw failure. I saw upset. I saw uh, just not living up to the expectation that I think I had set for myself. Um, and I'm sure that society's expectations were also influencing that. But just where I was at the time, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't feel like I deserved that high five. So I, I think that that was probably the, the underlying reason why my reaction to the idea of doing it was this is stupid, when the truth is that I was. I was, I was not happy with myself and didn't think uh, a, a high five was, was deserved. It's really hard to hear how long you felt that way about yourself. Because I, I stood next to you for years, the sink right next to you. And when I looked at you, like I saw the world's best dad, amazing husband. I saw somebody who was absolutely integral to helping me build my business. I felt grateful for you. I didn't know you thought any of those things. You, you just kind of put on a smile and carried on. You were so sort of stoic about it. So can you explain, because I think that there's a lot of people, especially men, that really beat the hell out of themselves when their career doesn't go how they thought it was going to go or they get laid off or, you know, you become an entrepreneur and entrepreneurship looks fucking gra glamorous. It's a bitch especially in the restaurant business. And you had been an entrepreneur. So can you just share just a little bit of context for people so they understand like how long you would look in the mirror and see somebody that failed and why you felt that way? Oh, it had to have been 15 years anyway. 15 years? Oh yeah, no, I don't think it was I don't think it was just the the unraveling of the restaurant business that was the beginning of that I think that it, I'm not sure exactly when, but I, as you and I know, like I, the looking back on my very colorful career, I am grateful today for all of the things that I did, but having moved through so many different roles and responsibilities and industries and companies and job, the changes. job changes and I just never, ever related to myself like I was succeeding in a professional sense. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, concluded that therein lies the source of my failure because my job here is to be the provider, the proverbial provider, and to go, uh, quote, make it happen. And so the, so the, the discomfort with myself and 
my progress professionally w- was absolutely what I think dragged me down. Mm. And yeah, the being an entrepreneur can seem glamorous. I would say that at the time when this whole thing and the high five challenge or the, the book came out, you and I were, we were in the throes of it. I mean, we were talk about just getting up and putting on your boots and just diving into the fire every day. There wasn't, at least just didn't seem like there was a moment to actually stop and acknowledge the good. And quite frankly, you weren't acknowledging me like that. You might've seen me as a good husband or father or, you know, business partner, but those words weren't being shared between us. And so naturally I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get that reinforcement verbally from you. Mm. And, but I also think that the being in the thick of it and running as fast and as hard as we were didn't, uh, you know, the idea of stopping and looking in the mirror and seeing myself truly for who I am and the good that I have done and acknowledging all the failures as being a source of powerful learning and all that stuff. Fuck that. Like I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't. And that's why I say, I think the hardest part was, To, to stand in front of that mirror and see your whole self. And for guys, I think for guys, that is, for many, borderline feels impossible because that's what we do. We just get up, put the boots on, and go... Okay, you know, Mel needs something, the wife needs something, the kids need something, the the employer needs something. The dogs. Oh, okay, okay, let me jam in a quick workout, you know, maybe because maybe I'm thoughtful about what my mind body or spirit needs, but also something that I think is an afterthought for guys. And we put everybody but ourselves first. So the act of standing in front of a mirror and high-fiving yourself and looking yourself in the eyes and saying I love you outlandish concept but hugely hugely important and it doesn't happen unless you're sort of willing to really stop and slow down (laughs) and and consider that you you matter more than your wife your kids your (laughs) employer the rest of it and I think that's part of what has I think maybe over the years dragged me down was paying zero attention to me Mm. and paying all the attention or so I felt on everybody outside of me. And providing and trying to prove that you were successful and trying to earn money and live up to also your dad's expectations. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, if you really want to go back to the root (laughs) of it all, we could be here all day, but yes. Certainly growing up with a father that did what he did and accomplished what he accomplished. And uh, even even just the basics of putting on a suit and tie and packing a briefcase and catching a train and working in a sky ri- you know, a high rise in Manhattan. All of those things were just visual cues of what I thought I should be doing. None of which, of course, played out other than the occasional suit until... <laughs> until ties and the rest of it flew out the window but just I wasn't I wasn't being like my dad which is what I thought I was supposed to be mm. doing mm-hmm. so you get really emotional when you talk about looking at yourself in the mirror and I want to hear you talk more about that because I know that it's a bunch of things that come up for you because you're not in that place that you were in where you look in the mirror and see a failure and you don't believe those things about yourself. 
and the challenge of simply standing in the mirror and looking in the eyes. I agree with you. That's the hardest part of adding this habit to your morning routine. Just put the toothbrush down and be with the person in the mirror. Look them in the eyes and don't see a reflection, see a human being who needs you. That half of men and women can't or won't look at themselves. And and it's a good point because you can, it sounds weird, but you can look right through yourself in the mirror. Yes. Versus actually seeing yourself. Yes. And if you aren't looking through yourself, a lot of us look at all the things we don't like. And so even gazing at ourselves is an act of self-criticism because we're like, I hate my this, I hate my that, my you know, neck is saggy. And um, you, know, you have since done tremendous amount of therapy. You and I have done the psychedelic supervised therapies. You are in the middle of getting your master's in spiritual transpersonal psychology. You are getting your uh, training to be a death doula and to sit with people at the end of their life. And you have also started a men's retreat called Soul Degree. And you've been leading retreats with men for four years, Chris. And there's a lot of emotion that comes Six. up for you. Six years, sorry. Six <laughs> years. Terrible wife. <laughs> Can I get a high five? <laughs> Cheer me on even though. Thank you. Don't let go of my hand. I don't want to hold your hand. Um, you have been in the presence of so many men. And you've even had Oakley reach out to you and had you counsel some of his friends through anxiety and through issues. And I know there's a lot of emotion there. So, you know, can you like just speak to the men and the boys that may be listening or to the people in their lives that love them about what you've witnessed about, you know, the kind of coaching that you lead, the meditation circles that you lead, not like from, from what you want people to know about the importance of being able to look yourself in the mirror and learn how to take actions to truly support and love yourself. And that this is a very foreign concept for boys and men. Yeah, I think that the, uh, I mean, I often talked about, talk about soul degree as being a space that I hold for men that allows them to slow down. When the truth of the matter is, it's in the slowdown that all of those beautiful things can take place. And I, I think that, the the reason why there's a lot of emotion there for me particularly with guys is that and i and i speak to all the partners and the spouses the people that have sons and fathers and m male counterparts is that Brothers. yes it is the responsibility of the individual to be able to look in the mirror and see the whole person, foibles and all. But why there is a lot of emotion is because in my experience in sitting with men, very rarely do men feel truly seen and heard. Hmm. And that's not on an emotional level. So let's go back to the mirror and what you experienced when for five days in a row, you made it a habit to stop at a time in your life where you still were beating the shit out of yourself and look yourself in the eyes and either say, I love you, which I know is one of your practices to look yourself in the eyes in the mirror and say, I love you. But, you know, to me, one of the powers of the high five habit is there's a lot of people that won't say, I love you. And so the physical action of giving the person in the mirror a high five demonstrates love. 
And so what did you experience for yourself personally in terms of the science working, the shift in how you started to see the person in the mirror? Well, transformation doesn't happen without repetition. Mm -hmm. And I think at one point, I don't know if, I don't remember if this is in the book, but the idea that there's so many mirrors out there in the world, <laughs> I mean, you come across a mirror a dozen times a day, potentially. Yeah. And I tried that during the challenge was just, it wasn't just brush teeth in the morning one time. It was whenever I saw a mirror. And I think that that that's critically important because this this high five thing, th this idea, it's not, I know you call it the high five habit, but it's one of those things that doesn't, it almost feels elusive in terms of becoming habitual. And that's because next week or next year, some shit might go down right. and you might do something or something happens where you really feel sub immediately lousy about mm -hmm. yourself. And mm -hmm. so even though there may be some habit of you getting up saying, I love you or high-fiving yourself, your life circumstance is going to get in the way right? frequently. Correct. Just like with exercise or drinking your water or getting a good night's sleep. But when you come back to that mo moment, because for me personally, it's a moment of joining in with myself. It's a moment of partnership with myself. And you used to coach almost all the, you know, teams that our kids played on when they were little, uh, you know, when they're really little. And as a coach, like if you think about when you high five a kid, it's either to congratulate them for something that they did or it's to help them shake something off and know that there's somebody that believes in them and to get back out there into the game. And for me, whether it's the high five I give myself in the morning after I brush my teeth and the moment I take to look at myself in the mirror, or like you said, I don't always high five myself throughout the day when I see a mirror, but I'll tell you something, I look at myself differently. And I know you do too. And so the importance of this because it is something that most of us don't do. I think we casually slip into the subconscious where we're beating ourselves up and we're on autopilot. And every time you pass a mirror, you have a chance to look yourself in the eyes and see a person that is worthy of celebrating, of cheering for, of believing in simply because you're here. That to me is the power of this. What is the power of it for you? I, I'm still a little steeped in acknowledging that, yes, I'm here, but not like here physically and how great this is that I'm alive and breathing. Yes, that's all amazing. But when I look in the mirror, it's what I see is... I see, I, I guess I can see the age and the wisdom and the learning more it, it, that I, I'm more grateful for that, for having been through what I've been through. And so the looking in the mirror and the acknowledging of myself it's rarely like, okay, you got this, you know, all right, your next meeting or your next whatever. You Maybe know, okay. it should be. Maybe. But I, like I said, I'm, I, I look forward less than I do look back. Great. And today in the look back, there's more gratitude and appreciation and a willingness to high five those elements of me, which for so many years I hated. When you look in the mirror, can you describe the person you see today? I see a man 
for who he is. And I see a man with different but the same number of battle scars that every other man, I think, has in the sense of what I've been through, what's worked, what hasn't worked. I see a man who's worked his ass off, but not necessarily with the right mindset or for the right reasons. Mm. Like if there's regret, it's probably, that's probably the area to to dig in for me is just being able to completely release that, yeah, I, whatever, I made that choice for for that reason at that time with the tools that I had right. and that's all I knew. And so I see today looking in the mirror somebody that is accepting of those decisions and choices that I made and even acknowledging the pain and the struggle that I was also blind to. I mean, mm. the idea of sort of coming to terms with having battled depression, I think I was oblivious to that for many years without, just didn't even occur to me. That might have been part of the resistance too, to, I mean, if you're battling, if you're battling depression, a high five in the mirror definitely feels like the last thing in the world you would ever pursue. Uh, but it's something that you should. Oh, without a doubt. I see a man I love. I see a man I'm proud of. I see a great father. And I see a great partner to you. Mm -hmm. And I see a man who has accomplished a lot in a short period of time. I see a man who's doing his best and deserves a look in the eye and a high five. All right. Well, I'll give you one. Oh, my God. I think one last thing I want to say to the men out there, any man who feels a sense of failure or that they haven't lived up to their own expectations or those outside of them. Any man who's been battling with or has battled with addiction or depression or any of these things that drag us down, mm. I strongly encourage you to start with you and to begin with forgiveness not always so easy but without a doubt I know from my experience not just me personally but being in the company of lots of men that we are all working our ass off to do the right thing And while we don't always believe that the results live up, it's in the forgiveness and the starting with yourself and the self-acknowledgement. And I want to go back to what you said in the very beginning, because I know that we're going to get a ton of questions, Chris. Wow. Wow. How do I begin that? One step that you could take today is trying this habit of even just looking yourself in the mirror. Uh, I, I'm shocked that I'm even saying this, <laughs> given my initial reaction to the high five habit. But I agree. Start right there. Start in the mirror. Because if you change 
the story you're telling yourself about the person you see in the mirror, if you change the actions that you take in how you treat the human being in the mirror, if you change what you're thinking when you look in the eyes of the person in the mirror, that is the beginning of forgiving yourself. Like you will never forgive yourself if you, if you refuse to look yourself in the eyes with compassion and with forgiveness and with understanding. And one of the reasons why I'm, I'm going to keep hammering this, everybody, raise your hand and high five the mirror. Because if you're at a place where you are beating the shit out of yourself and you can't stand yourself for whatever reason, whatever you did, we've all done something, you don't have to change your thoughts the neurobics and the science of simply making the physical gesture of the high five, Chris, and all of the lifetime of positive programming associated with it, it has a chemical, a neurological, a psychological benefit immediately that is grounded in science. And so the physical act does the work for you And it starts to plow new neural pathways and it releases dopamine, all of which will help you do the other work that you need to do to walk down the road of forgiving yourself. But if you got to start by simply looking at yourself in the eyes and seeing somebody who is worthy of forgiving because you are. Yeah, I, I can't stress that enough. You could... You could forgive yourself all day long walking down the sidewalk, but it, it, that's, a, that's a futile exercise. The mirror is where it happens and seeing yourself. Hmm. It's one of the reasons why I always sign off the show by telling the person listening that I love you. I and love that about how you sign off. And I know you mean it. I do mean it because... Um, I just know how many people can't look at themselves in the mirror. Like, it's just so sad. And I know how much self-judgment we all live with because I've lived with it. I was, I even learned that it's been 15 years today that you really struggled with loving yourself. And it breaks my heart. And it, it, it feels good to have somebody tell you that they love you and that you're proud of them. And uh, to some extent, unless you're willing to do the work on yourself, to let love in from yourself, to demonstrate encouragement, support, and love by looking at your eyes in the mirror or high-fiving yourself in the mirror, if you can't do that for yourself, you will never let the love in that is all around you from other people because you don't believe you're worthy of it and you're proving it based on your actions. What are you thinking about? Because I can see you getting moved. Well, I'm I'm always moved by the way that you sign off and tell people I, I love you. And it, it ties back to what I was saying earlier is just my own experience in being in the company of men who don't, you know, they don't feel that. Hmm. Uh, and I guess since a lot of what I've been talking about is directed towards the guys I would leave you with one last thought and that is that while you're standing in front of that mirror and you're looking at yourself you may feel alone but you are not alone in either the struggle you have with forgiving yourself or the judgments or the failures or Whatever that may be, you are not alone. At a really wild level, there's actually a human being in the mirror who needs you. It's the one person you spend your whole life with. And the moment that you can look them in the eyes and see a human being worth cheering for, you'll realize you aren't alone because you've got yourself. You know, I want to thank you, Chris. And thank you for speaking directly to men because... You know, everything that you're saying is universal. And I do think it's important, though, for 
men and boys and people who identify as male, that you hear a male voice saying these things. It is critical that other men realize that your emotional health, your sense of self-esteem, self-awareness, self-love, and going back to the very beginning of what I said at the beginning of uh, this episode today is that I think we get self-love wrong, Chris, because we think love is a feeling. But the truth is, you only feel loved because of other people's actions. And when it comes to learning to love yourself, you have to start with the actions. Actions that demonstrate love. And when you are able to stand in front of a mirror and look yourself in the eyes, that's an act of love. When you're able to bring compassion and understanding to the person in the mirror and you see somebody that's trying and you see somebody that has regrets and you see somebody who still has an incredible life to live and is worthy of love, that's an act of love. When you raise your hand and high five yourself and the human being in the mirror, that's an act of love. And so I love what you said because so many of us know and wish that we felt better about ourselves. We wish we would stop beating the shit out of ourselves. We wish that we weren't in our own way. And all the research also shows that the most important habit that has the biggest impact on our lives is being kind to yourself. It's in the actions, everybody. And so I just love that you shared all that. And I love that you're here. And I love you. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.